Um, I, I read somewhere recently that um, you are one of the most respected women in, in America. How does that make you feel and why do you think people have that feeling about you? Uh, I don't know because I really don't try to be respectable. Mm -hmm. You know, I'm, I'm I'm actually shocked that I'm respectable mm -hmm. <laughs> and respected mm -hmm. in in some ways um, because I I think that you know I have gone through so many changes and done things in my life mm -hmm. uh, that I was brought up to believe were disreputable. Mm -hmm. You know. Uh, you know, I've had an abortion, which in my community is just the most horrible thing that you could possibly do. Right. I, I married a white man, right. which was the worst thing anybody could do, I mean, right. according to the way I was raised. Um, you know, I, I have lived my life really uh, just exactly the way I wanted to live it, mm -hmm. you know. Um, so that I've, I've often felt, you know, sort of on, on the wrong side. Uh, of respectability. Of respectability. Mm -hmm. But I think that there is something in people uh, that admires um, that kind of d decision, that determination to actually live as yourself rather mm -hmm. than as someone else, or to live as you see fit rather than as other people would have you live. I want to read you some poems from. Um, Revolutionary Petunias. This is a poem, a, a book of poems that I wrote basically when I was living in Mississippi, where I lived for seven years, very hard years, um, but also a time when I learned a lot. And um, really became uh, a woman in, in a lot of ways. Um, grew up. I had uh, grown up in Georgia and left Georgia because it was, it was rather painful and I needed to go away to get an education. And once being out of Georgia, I thought I would never go back south. And I, uh, after graduation, had a scholarship <clears throat> that I could use to go to West Africa or to Mississippi. And I thought, <laughs> that's not much of a choice. <laughs> So then the morning that I was going to go to Senegal, <clears throat> I found myself going to Jackson. And I stayed there for seven years. Um, and I really um, saw things, you know, I, I saw the same things that I had seen in Georgia, but with a new understanding. And I really grew to, to love the South even more uh, because I could understand its complexity as an adult <clears throat> in ways that I couldn't as a child. But in any case, there were all these, there were these moments of, of so much loss, you know, so much loss, and sometimes the gain didn't seem ample compensation. And I wrote this poem, which is called Expect Nothing. Expect nothing. Live frugally on surprise. Become a stranger to need of pity, or if compassion be freely given out, take only enough. Stop short of the urge to plead, then purge away the need. Wish for nothing larger than your own small heart, or greater than a star. Tame wild disappointment with caress unmoved and cold. Make of it a parker for your soul. Discover the reason why so tiny human midget exists at all, so scared and unwise. But expect nothing. Live frugally on surprise. Um, I wanted to be a scientist. I don't know why. I think I think when I was growing up, I thought scientists were people who actually helped people, mm -hmm. um, and I don't really believe that much anymore. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, I I wanted to play the piano, and I couldn't afford it, uh -huh. and I wanted to paint, and I couldn't afford paint, um, and I could afford pen and, and paper or mm -hmm. pencil and paper.
Mm -hmm. And so it was cheap, and that's what I did. They have fenced in the dirt road that once led towards Chapel AME Church, and cows graze among the stones that mark my family's graves. The massive oak is gone from out the churchyard, but the giant space is left unfilled despite the two-lane blacktop that slides across the old, unalterable roots. Today I bring my own child here to this place where my father's grandmother rests undisturbed beneath the Georgia sun. Above her, the neat stepping hooves of cattle. Here the graves soon grow back into the land, have been known to sink, to drop open without warning, to cover themselves with wild, wild ivy, blackberries, bittersweet, and sage. No one knows why, and no one asks, when burning off day comes, as it does some years, the graves are haphazardly cleared and snakes hacked to death and burned sizzling in the brush. The odor of smoke, oak leaves, honeysuckle. Forgetful of geographic resolutions as birds, the far-flung young fly south to bury the old dead. The old women move quietly up and touch Sis Rachel's face. Tell Jesus I'm coming, they say. Tell him I ain't going to be long. My grandfather turns his creaking head away from the lavender box. He does not cry, but looks afraid. For years he called her woman, shortened over the decades to omen. On the cut stone for Omen's grave, he did not notice they had misspelled her name. The stone reads, Rachel Walker, not Rachel, loving wife, devoted mother. As a young woman, who had known her, tripping eagerly, loving wife, to my grandfather's bed? Not pretty, but serviceable, a hard worker with rough, moist hands. Her own two babies, dead before she came, came to seven children, to aprons and sweat, came to quilt making, came to canning in vegetable gardens, biggest fields, came to fields to plow, cotton to chop, potatoes to dig, came to multiple measles, chicken pox and croup, came to water from springs, came to leaning houses one story high, came to rivalries, Saturday night battles, came to straightened hair, noxema, and feet washing at the Hard Shell Baptist Church, came to zinnias around the woodpile, came to grandchildren not of her blood, whom she taught to dip snuff without sneezing, came to death blank, forgetful of it all, so that when he called her omen, she no longer listened or heard or knew or felt. It is not until I see my first grade teacher review her body that I cry, not for the dead, but for the gray in my first grade teacher's hair, for memories of before I was born, when teacher and grandmother loved each other, and later above the ducks made of soap, and the orange-legged chicks Miss Reynolds drew over my own small hand on paper with wide blue lines, not for the dead, but for memories, none of them sad, but seen from the angle of her death. What kind of an encouragement did you get from your family, the, the community? Uh, who kind of nudged little Alice on and said, this is something you're good at, this is something you can't afford to do as a young black girl, you know, mm -hmm. in Eatonton? Who were the people that... Well, the people in my community, and, and mainly my teachers. Mm -hmm. I started school when I was four because my mom had to go to work in the fields all day. Mm -hmm. And so she had to leave me with my first grade teacher, who also bought me my first clothes. Uh -huh. um, and I always feel and always felt very supported by the, the elders and, and the women and the men, everybody mm -hmm. in my community. They. Um, 
they really seemed to love me. Uh, I was a very loving little girl too. Mm -hmm. I, I was always, I was just thinking how um, now my hair is turning white and how much I love it, you know. Mm -hmm. And I was thinking, why do I, you know, apparently in all the world, is totally crazy about white hair, <laughs> you know, why is this? Uh, and I, I think it's because my first experience of someone with white hair was a wonderful one and that the, the old people in my community uh, seemed to me to get, get lovelier uh -huh. uh, as they, you know, sort of got grayer. And, but I think the reason they seemed that way to me was that, you know, they, they did become more loving. Mm -hmm. they, they, they had, you know, they slowed down a bit and they could listen to you and, and they were sort of always there. And I think I, I connect then graying with, with a sort of ascension into compassion and, and patience and mm -hmm. wisdom. Mm -hmm. So it's not a negative thing for me. Mm -hmm. I want to read a section from uh, The Color Purple. This is, this is known as the God section. Uh, <laughs> and this is uh, Seely writing to, to Nettie um, after she realizes that Nettie is the closest thing to a God she will ever know at this point. <clears throat> Mainly because Nettie has ears, Nettie has feelings, and Nettie returns her love. Dear Nettie, I don't write to God no more, I write to you. What happened to God, I shook. Who that, I said. She looked at me serious. Bigger devil as you is, I said, you're not worried about no God, surely. She said, wait a minute, hold on just a minute here. Just cause I don't harass it like some people us know don't mean I ain't got religion. Well, what God do for me, I asked. She said, see me, like she's shocked. He gave you life, good health, and a good woman that loved you to death. <laughs> yeah, I said, he give me a lynch daddy, a crazy mama, a low-down dog, or a steppa, and a sister I probably won't ever hear or see again. Anyhow, I say, the God I've been praying and writing to is a man, and act just like all the other men's I know, <laughs> trifling, forgetful, and low-down. <laughs> She said, Miss Seeley, you better hush. God might hear you. Let him hear me, I say. If he ever listened to poor colored women, the world would be a different place, I can tell you. <laughs> she talked and she talked, trying to budge me away from blasphemy. But I blaspheme much as I want to. <laughs> All my life, I never cared wh what people thought about nothing I did, I say. But deep in my heart, I care about God. What are you going to think? And come to find out, he don't think. Just sit up there glorying and being deep, I reckon. <laughs> but it ain't easy trying to do without God, even if you know he ain't there. Trying to do without him is a strain. <laughs> I is a sinner, says Shug, because I was born. I don't deny it. But once you find out what's out there waiting for us, what else can you be? Sinners have more good times, I say. You know why, she asked? Because you ain't all the time worrying about God, I say. No, that ain't it, she say. Us worry about God a lot. But once us feel loved by God, us do the best us can to please Him with what us like. <laughs> you telling me God loves you and you ain't never done nothing for Him? I mean, not go to church, sing in the choir, feed the preaching, all like that? But if God loved me, Seely, I don't have to do all that unless I want to. There's a lot of other things I can do that I expect God likes. Like what, I asked. Oh, she said, I can lay back and just admire stuff. Be happy. Have a good time. Well, this sounds like blasphemy show enough. <laughs> she said, Seely, tell the truth. Have you ever found God in church? I never did. I just found a bunch of folks hoping for him to show. <laughs> Any God I ever felt in church I brought in with me. And I think all the other folks did too. They come to church to share God, not find God. Some folks didn't even have him to share, I said. 
They the ones didn't speak to me while I was there struggling with my big belly and Mrs. Rotten cheering. Right, she said. Then she said, tell me what your God looked like, Celie. Oh, no, I said, I'm, I'm too shamed. Nobody ever asked me that before. So I'm kind of took by surprise. Besides, when I think about it, it don't seem quite right. But at all I got, I decided to stick up for him just to see what Suge say. <laughs> okay, I say. He big and old and tall and gray bearded and white. He wear white robes and go barefooted. Big eyes, big blue eyes, she asked. Sort of bluish gray. Cool, big though. White lashes, I say. She laughed. Why you laugh, I asked. I don't think it's so funny. What you expect him to look like, mister? <laughs> that wouldn't be no improvement, she say. <laughs> then she tell me this old white man is the same God she used to see when she prayed. If you wait to find God in the church, Seely, she say, that's who's bound to show up, because that's where he lived. <laughs> well, how come, I asked. Because that's the one that's in the white folks' white Bible. <laughs> Suge, I say. God wrote the Bible. White folks had nothing to do with it. <laughs> How come it looked just like them then, she say. <laughs> Only bigger and a heap more hair. <laughs> How come the Bible just like everything else they make? All about them doing one thing and another, and all the colored folks doing is getting cursed. I never thought about that. Nettie say somewhere in the Bible that said Jesus' hair was like lamb's wool, I say. Well, says Suge, if you come to any of these churches we talking about, he'd have to have it comped before anybody paid him any attention. <laughs> the last thing these people want to think about their God is that his hair can't be. <laughs> That's the truth, I say. <laughs> Ain't no way to read the Bible and not thank God white, she say. Then she sighed. When I found out that I thought God was white and a man, I lost interest. <laughs> you mad because he don't seem to listen to your prayers. <clears throat> Do the male listen to anything colored say? Ask Sophia, she said. But I don't have to ask Sophia. I know white people never listen to colored, period. If they do, they only listen long enough to be able to tell you what to do. Here's the thing, say Shug, the thing I believe. God is inside you and inside everybody else. You come into the world with God. But only them that search for it inside find it. And sometimes it just manifests itself even if you're not looking. I don't know what you're looking for. Trouble do it for most folks, I think. Sorrow. Feeling like shit. <laughs> you call it a, a it, I asked. Yeah, she said. God ain't a he or a she, but a it. But what do it look like, I asked. Don't look like nothing, she said. It ain't a picture show. <laughs> it ain't something you can look at apart from anything else, including yourself. I believe God is everything, says Shug. Everything that is or ever was or ever will be. And when you can feel that and be happy to feel that, you found it. Shug, a beautiful something, let me tell you. She frowned a little, looked out across the yard, Lean back in a chair, looked just like a big rose. She said, my first step from that old white man was trees, then air, then birds, then other people. But one day when I was sitting quiet and feeling like a motherless child, which I was, it come to me, that feeling of being part of everything and not separate at all. I knew that if I cut a tree, my arm would bleed. And I laughed and I cried and I ran all around the house. I knew just what it was. In fact, when it happened, you can't miss it. It's sort of like, you know what, she say, grinning and rubbing high up on my thigh. Should I say. Oh, she said, God love all them feelings. That's some of the best stuff God ever did. <laughs> and when you know God loves and you enjoy them a lot more, you can just relax, go with everything that's going. And praise God by liking what you like. God don't think it dirty, I asked. No, she said. God made it. Listen. God love everything you love and a mess of stuff you don't. But more than anything else, 
God love admiration. You saying God vain? I asked. No, she said, not vain. Just wanted to share a good thing. I think it pisses God off if you walk by the color purple in a field somewhere and don't even notice it. Well, what'd it do when it pissed off, I asked. <laughs> oh, it makes something else. People think pleasing God is all God care about. But any fool living in the world can see it always trying to please us back. Yeah, I say. Yeah, she said. It always making little surprises and springing them on us when us least expect. You mean it want to be loved, just like the Bible say? Yes, Phoebe, she say. Everything want to be loved. Us sing and dance, make faces and give flower bouquets, trying to be loved. You ever notice that trees do everything to get attention that we do, except walk? Well, us talk and talk about God, but I'm still adrift, trying to chase that old white man out of my head. I've been so busy thinking about him, I never truly noticed nothing God make. Not a blade of corn. How it do that? Not the color purple. Where it come from? Not the little wildflowers. Nothing. Now that my eyes opening, I feel like a fool. And next to any little scrub of a bush in my yard, Mr. Evil sort of shrank, but not altogether. <laughs> Still, it is like Shug say, you have to get man off your eyeball before you can see anything at all. <laughs> man corrupt everything, say Shug. He on your box of grits, he in your head, and all over the radio. He try to make you think he everywhere. As soon as you think he everywhere, you think he God. But he ain't. Whenever you're trying to pray, and man plop himself on the other end of it. Tell him to get lost, says Shug. Conjure up flowers, wind, water, a big rock. But this hard work, I can tell you. He been there so long, he don't want to budge. He threatened lightning, floods, and earthquakes. Us fight. I hardly pray at all. And every time I conjure up a rock, I throw it. Amen. <laughs> you were um, uh, spent some time in Mississippi during during the '60s, and uh, I think this very month is the the 25th anniversary of the, the Mississippi uh, Freedom Summer mm -hmm. Project. How did that experience, that summer, affect you? And how do you assess, uh, good or bad, how the country's gone in, in the past 25 years since, since that? Um, well, well what, the summer of 64 was the summer that uh, the three civil rights workers were lynched. Right. I went there for the first time in 1966 to work in the movement. I worked there for a summer. Then. I married the law student that I met there and we went back to live for seven years in Mississippi. And our goal was really to, um, to try to do our part to make that, that section of the country inhabitable for people mm -hmm. like us. Uh, that is to say, you know, black people and, and white people who really, you know, wanted to live in the whole country right. and not in pockets and liberated sections, you know. Um, and I think we really did accomplish that. I think the South, oh, I know the South is so different. The South that I visit now is so different um, than the one I grew up in. In fact, I was in Washington not long ago uh, doing a, a book signing, <clears throat> and there were a couple of Mississippians, white Mississippians, who came through. And they were saying, you know, we keep inviting you to come to Ole Miss, uh, and, you know, when are you coming? We really want you to come. And I said, well, I mean, because they seem, you know, really sweet. And I said, well, you know, uh, maybe I'll come soon. And they said, why, you know, why haven't you come when we've been invited? So I said, it's just, it's too painful, mm -hmm. you know? I mean, it just hurts. And, um, you know, I, the people that you, you see, you know, you know, just really, um, 
as they say, watering the tree of freedom with their blood, you know. Mm-hmm. Uh, and and I, I just, this is hard. So, um, he, the guy said to me, he looked at me and he said, with real feeling, and this was really important. I mean, I, one day he'll understand maybe how important it was that he said this. He said, you know, I'm so sorry. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And I don't know, I kind of hope being sorry will help, Yeah. you know. Well, I think as you said, it was that uh, he probably didn't realize of what a major step that was. He didn't realize himself probably the oh. significance of saying that in a way that you could clearly understand mm. what he meant. Yeah, but well, yeah. well, I mean, you know, it's all I remember from those years is, you know, one white man after another saying just the opposite. Right. And then backing it up with such uh, violence. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. But we shall overcome. Yeah. <laughs>